morning, church family. It's wonderful to uh, have the privilege once again to open up God's Word with you. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with them to Mark chapter 1. We've been uh, five weeks now, this is our fifth week, in uh, this new series called The Lion and the Lamb as we're studying through the book of Mark. We'll finish off the first chapter today. And uh, just as you kind of get settled and find your place in the Bible and uh, get comfortable in your seat, uh, by way of reminder, Mark's gospel has sort of begun with a flurry of activity. After a very short but punchy intro, Mark introduces us to John the Baptizer, who we saw is the herald of this new king that he's about to tell the story about. The new king arrives on the scene, Jesus of Nazareth. He gets baptized, which is sort of like his crowning or his coronation. And immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness for a confrontation with Satan. In that confrontation, Jesus emerges victorious, the true Adam, the true Israel, the true king of the world, ready to take godly dominion that Adam failed to take. And then the rest of chapter 1 we saw was a demonstration of that far-reaching authority of Jesus, the new king. Uh, this series is called The Lion and the Lamb. As I said, Jesus is both the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's both the powerful conqueror and he's the sacrificial savior. So with that quick introduction, we're going to jump into our text this morning. And the text, uh, I'm going to back up just a couple of verses to a few that we read last week. Um, but I'm going to start in verse 32 and I'll finish off the chapter of, uh, of Mark. So here's the word of the Lord to us. That evening, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. <clears throat> and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place... And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. So that's the word of the Lord to us this morning. Let's pray and ask that the Lord would uh, speak to us from it and then we'll jump into uh, to, to it a little bit. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your entire word is good and profitable for training us in righteousness, and we pray that it would do just that this morning. I pray that you'd speak to us from your word, that you would train us from your word, and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Please silence my lips from saying anything that's not true of you or your word, and I pray that you'd be glorified this morning, both in the speaking, the proclaiming, and the hearing and the applying of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here we are in the book of Mark, and um, the first thing that I want you to notice is more of a narrative feature, really, than anything else, but home base for Jesus is Capernaum. So, like I said last week, Mark has really skipped over some of the early life of Jesus in the southern areas and uh, in Jerusalem and Judea, and he's gone and shot straight to Jesus' ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Now, many of us know that the 
bulk of Jesus' ministry was in and around the Sea of Galilee. That's where the bulk of his ministry took place. And Capernaum is sort of like home base for Jesus. We're going to see in Mark 2 that it's a little unclear whether or not he has his own home in Capernaum. Probably more likely he's staying at Peter's home in Capernaum. But that sort of becomes home base. We see that he's in Capernaum for um, most of the details of Mark chapter 1. He gets up to leave in the text that we read today. And then chapter 2 actually starts when he comes back to Capernaum after doing some preaching and teaching in the synagogues in and around Galilee. One of the other things you'll notice, if you take a look at, um, at verse 38, when the disciples come out to find Jesus, he says, Let us go on to the next towns that I might preach there also, for that is why I came out. So Jesus is prioritizing his preaching ministry, but look at the very next verse. He went throughout all Galilee, so this is a summary statement of some of the ministry of Jesus, but he went through all Galilee, and notice he does two things in the synagogues. He preaches there, and he casts out demons there. Remember, like we said last week, that one of the first confrontations Jesus has with a demon, in fact, the first confrontation that Mark records, is in the synagogue. That by the time the Messiah arrives on the scene, that the forces of darkness have infiltrated even the religious system of his day, so that whenever he goes to the synagogues, he's both preaching and casting out demons. And so where Jesus is finding the most opposition to his ministry is within the organized church, if you will. It's an interesting thought for us to consider, especially as we continue through Mark, and, and Mark is going to allow this, uh, this confrontation with the religious leaders of Jesus' day to, um, to kind of culminate. But Capernaum is home base for Jesus, and Capernaum is a small fishing village, sort of on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and by boat, Jesus could go there and do ministry all over Galilee. And that's exactly what we see Jesus does through the, uh, the bulk of his ministry. Now, last week, I neglected to, to mention it, but you may have noticed that the sermon title last week was The Lion's Pride. And what we looked at last week were several of these stories that showed the authority of Jesus, that he has authority over sin, the authority over Satan, that he has authority over the lives of sinners, that he has authority over the demonic, that he has authority over disease and illness. And so last week as we were looking at that authority, the sermon was titled Lion's Pride because a pride describes both the group of sort of lionesses and cubs as well as the territory that's under the jurisdiction of an alpha lion. And so last week we saw, like I said, that Jesus, this new king, is establishing a kingdom and his kingdom lays claim over sin, sinners, sickness, disease, demons, all of it. All of it is under the authority of Jesus. So we could say that Jesus, the Lion of Judah, has a pride that stretches over every area of the globe into every tribe, every family, every parliament, every facet of the culture. Today's sermon, in contrast, is called The Lamb's Humility. And what I think Mark does, and I think he does it really well, is he contrasts everything that we saw last week, the authority of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the confrontational um, attitude that Jesus often displays, especially in the synagogues, and contrasting that with the sort of meekness and the gentleness and the humility that we're about to see today. So he contrasts the unlimited power and authority of Jesus with his humble meekness. And I think he does that in a couple of ways. So we'll kind of go through um, the text today, and we'll go through it with a few points. And, and so the, all of these points will be sort of under the heading, Jesus di displays his lamb-like humility in these four ways. So Jesus displays his lamb-like humility by, number one, muting the demons. Muting the demons. So notice, we backed up to verse 32 for a reason. So what's been going on, you can even look at verse 29 there. It says that Jesus left the synagogue. This is after he um, cast out the first demon in the synagogue in Capernaum there. And then he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And then verse 32 comes along. It says, that evening at sundown, they, that is the, the city people, brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. 
But look at this. And he would not permit the demons to speak because he knew them. So you get this, this story where Jesus shows his authority over the demons. He shows his authority over sickness and disease. And as a result of that, his fame spreads in the town. And now the townspeople are coming to him and bringing to them all the people who are sick, all the people who are oppressed by demons. And Mark, like I said, he gives us very little detail throughout his, this quick-paced narrative of his. But he does take the time to say that every time Jesus casts out a demon, he does not allow the demon to speak because they knew him. And if you jump up to verse 24, you remember that the first demon that Jesus encountered in Capernaum says, I know who you are. He says, the Holy One of God. So that's what Mark is talking about. That's, what Je- that's why Jesus is muting them. He's muting the demons because they know him. They know that he's the Holy One of God. And Jesus did not want his fame to spread too quickly or too rapidly. To kind of put this in modern language, it seems like Jesus has just gone viral a little bit. And with the entire town looking for him and people beginning to travel to find him for healing and for deliverance, what Jesus wants is reprieve from the fame. It's interesting because we live in a culture, especially now with social media and everything, even when I use the term going viral and everybody kind of chuckles, we know we live in this culture now that that desires attention that desires to be seen and looked at. Now, now, of course, we only want the best parts of us seen, but we have this desire for fame, for attention, right? How many, how many young people in growing up in this new social media world have a lot of their worth and their value tied to their social media presence? How many likes they're getting on photos? How many friends they have online? All that kind of stuff. It's a major problem, especially for young people who are uh, raised with very little restrictions on their access to social media. But all that to say, we see something different in Jesus. We see a desire to keep his fame and his popularity under wraps. He doesn't want it to spread out. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think there's definitely, there's a principle of humility here. But even more than that, I think what this shows us is that Jesus wanted, as much as possible, for people to encounter him personally. He wanted them to encounter him personally. Jesus knew the dangers associated with the telephone game, that when words spread through the mouths of other people, his message could get distorted. And indeed, that's what happens. Later on in the book of Mark, we'll see that there are all kinds of accusations lobbied against Jesus that aren't true. But Jesus understands that when the message is spread through the mouths of others, the message itself can get distorted. And you notice that he says, the main reason I came here is that I might preach. So let's go do that. So what Jesus wanted is he wanted to personally deliver the message of the kingdom. And he wanted individuals to meet with him and encounter him personally. Because he knows that as wonderful as it is to spread the good news of the new king... The greatest way that you can be changed by that king is with a personal encounter. And so Jesus is showing that with his desire to mute the demons and to not see his fame spread too quickly. Second way that I think Jesus displays his humility humility is his willingness to serve others. His willingness to serve others. Now we know this about Jesus, right? If we were to list off good qualities of Jesus. Probably many of us would say, oh, he was always serving other people. And maybe some of the verses that come to mind are are those that, like in Mark chapter 9, where it says, you know, he's saying to his disciples, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom for many. But in our text today, and I, I just read it, so I won't go through it verse by verse again, but look at verses 32 to 34. Right? So at sundown that evening, after a day of ministry... Okay, I want you to note that. After a day of ministry, he was in the synagogue's teaching. He had cast out a demon. He had traveled around. And now after a day of ministry, after a hard day's work, Jesus comes back and the crowds push in on him. Imagine this, especially parents of little ones, and you know this well. Those of you who work jobs that come home with you, those of us who work in ministry, Jesus has just spent a long day teaching preaching, healing, serving, and now in the evening, at his place of private retreat, it says the whole city is gathered at his door. 
Right? Imagine that. You just put in a long, hard day's work. After a long, hard day's work, you finally punch out, you head home, and your boss is knocking at your door. Some of you are like, yeah, he doesn't have to knock at my door. I have this thing called a cell phone. It's constantly buzzing. And you know the agitation when you're all done work or you're all done after a hard day and something else happens. For some of us as parents who feel entitled to our evenings free, it's long, hard day with the kids. You finally get them down and then they come out of bed half an hour later, right? And slowly your sanctification melts away. But we know what it's like to feel entitled to rest and some leisure and to have that interrupted. And so Jesus, after a long, hard day's work, goes to his place of private retreat, and it says the whole city comes to his door. And what does Jesus do? Does he send them away? Does he tell them to come back during business hours? Does he tell them that he only sees people at the office? No, what he does is he spends the rest of his night ministering to them, and he turns no one away. We see the heart of Jesus here in his willingness to serve others. And I, I, I do want you to get this, that there's a quality of Jesus' ministry that I think is often overlooked. All right, so here's a quality of Jesus' ministry that I think many of us have never taken the time to think about. And I'll, 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 I'll introduce it to you by way of a question. How interruptible are you? How interruptible are you? When you look, and especially Mark does this better than any of the other gospel writers, when you read the story of Jesus... His ministry seems like one interruption after another. In a couple chapters, what we're going to see is, is uh, a, a guy named Jairus comes, and he says, my daughter is sick, can you come? And so Jesus was doing something, and the guy comes, and he says, can you come and heal my sick daughter? So Jesus, it says, drops what he was doing, and he goes to go and heal Jairus' daughter. And what happens on the way? All of a sudden, his cloak gets pulled by a woman with an issue of blood, and he turns around, he heals her, goes off, Jesus' ministry was one of constant interruption. And constantly, the people who were interrupting him were the people with greatest need. And over and over again, we don't see a Jesus whose patience dissipates to the moment he snaps. We see Jesus who constantly is giving, constantly interruptible, constantly at the, um, ready to minister to the needs of others. And, and not only is that quality just a, a wonderful quality in and of itself, but I want you to pair it with what else we know about Jesus, right? This is the king of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, not coming to lord his status over anyone, but to serve others. And remember that Jesus is fully human. He's prone to fatigue, exhaustion. He needed sleep. He needed food for sustenance. And Jesus, fully human, was willing to forego his own needs to meet the needs of others. I think that's one of the qualities of Jesus we don't often take time to think through. But certainly in our world, where we like everything planned, we like to be where we're supposed to be, where we like it all laid out for us, and we don't like to be interrupted, seeing the very interruptible ministry of Jesus and his heart to serve others is really, really helpful. Third thing that I think displays his humility is this, his quiet commitment to spiritual disciplines. His quiet commitment to spiritual disciplines. Now, by spiritual disciplines, I, I mean a whole whack of things, but certainly in this context, what I'm talking about in this story is his commitment to prayer and quiet time with the Father. What does Jesus do when his energy is depleted, right? So we've already seen long, hard day's work. He goes home, his place of private retreat. The whole city comes to the house, knocking at the door. He ministers to all of them. And then what does he do? Crash? Sleep in the next day? Turn off the, uh, the, the buzzer? No, no. What Jesus does is he actually gets up early in the morning, the next morning, right? It says, verse 35, And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. So after a long night serving others, he doesn't sleep in, he doesn't take a sabbatical, he doesn't call in sick the next day. He gets up early and retreats privately for some communion time with the Father and some prayer. Jesus knows that, humanly speaking, he cannot sustain the level of ministry and service without a personal connection to the Lord in prayer. That's what he knows. 
He knows that he can't keep up. Even, even the, the God of heaven, because he took on flesh and he's prone to all of the same um, fatigue that we are, he knows that he can't sustain this level of ministry and service to others unless he takes the time to personally connect with the Father. We often think that we're too busy to pray, or sometimes we're too busy for our quiet times, or too busy to dig into the Word of God ourselves. But Charles Spurgeon once rightly said this, We often think of ourselves too busy to pray, but this is a grave mistake, for prayer is a great time saver. We save not only time, but much heartache, when before we strive on our own, we align our hearts with God's in prayer. And when we find ourselves most disinclined to pray is often when we are most in need of it. Indeed, we are too busy not to pray. Isn't that a great quote? It's Charles Spurgeon. When you read the gospel accounts, take note of how often Jesus retired to a quiet place early in the morning to pray. You know, in, in my line of work, I get lots of people who, who uh, come to see me or talk to me or email me or message me when they have big life decisions going on, right? Should we move here? Should we stay here? Should we have another baby? Should we not have another baby? Should, we, uh, should I take this job or should I take this job? Lots of people looking for direction from the sovereign God. How does God direct sinners in the way that they should go? That's a great question. And one of the things that I often say is you think that the more pros and cons lists you write out, right? You think the more you, well, if I just go and see that job one more time, if I go and talk to that boss one more time, if I go and see the place one more time, if I do this, I think the number one way that God, a sovereign God directs us in the way that we should go is the more time we spend with him in prayer. People often ask me, you know, you have, I, Nate, you have such a, a massive view of God's sovereignty when we believe in God's meticulous sovereignty, what motivates us for prayer, right? If God sits in the heavens and he does all that he pleases, as uh, the Bible says, if uh, Ephesians 1.11 says that he does all things according to the counsel of his own will, if God knows all things, does all things, and has sovereignly um, set this story into being, then why is it that we pray? The number one reason, the most important reason that we pray is to align our hearts to God's. That's the most important thing that we do with praying. And I do, there is another answer to that, right? There is an answer that God is sovereign, but he's sovereign both over the ends and the means. And one of the ways in which God ordains to bring things about in the world around us is through the prayers of his people. So prayer is not useless. Prayer changes things. But the most important thing about prayer is that it aligns our hearts with his. And how many times have you prayed for something that you thought you desperately, in fact, probably des thought you desperately needed, and then you recognized that you just desperately wanted it, and the more and more you prayed, not only did you realize you didn't need it, but also that you don't actually want it because it wasn't what was best for you. That's what happens in prayer. And so when we look at Jesus, yes, of course, he's fully divine. He's connected to the Father. He's still God. But when we look at Jesus and how often he was obedient to the Father's will, do not just chalk that up to his divine nature. Credit the fact that, humanly speaking, he went out to align his heart with the Father's will over and over and over again. Every night, many of us who are reliant on our smartphones, right? I, I, I know I'm seeing some of you take notes on your smartphones. I know how reliant we are on our smartphones. Every night, what do we do to our smartphones to make sure they're ready for us the next day? Re recharge them, right? We know. In fact, there's, there's many times when you're lying in bed and you're like, oh, I forgot to plug in my phone. And I would be useless tomorrow without it. Recharging the phone is like how we need to be recharged with prayer. The Christian life, the Christian life does not work if we are not constantly in prayer. Prayer is the charging mechanism for your spiritual fruit. Let me say that one more time. Prayer is the charging mechanism for your spiritual fruit. It connects you to the source of your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. 
The fourth uh, way in which Jesus uh, displays his humility in this passage here is, uh, number four, his willingness to suffer in the place of sinners. So certainly his, his uh, willingness to serve others, right, his quiet commitment to spiritual disciplines, number four, his willingness to suffer in the place of sinners. There's a lot to be said about Jesus healing lepers. We, that's the last story we get here. So it starts in verse 40. And you've heard me say this many times, so I won't go into it. There's a few other stories in, uh, in the book of Mark where I'll be able to dig into this a little deeper because I have taught on this a few times in the last year. So I'll just leave it for this. I'll say, suffice to say that uh, part of the beauty of the new covenant is that the flow of power has been reversed. Instead of uncleanliness, sin, and death being contagious, it's cleanliness, righteousness, and life that are contagious. And the reason we see this is because Jesus, every time he heals a leper, doesn't just heal a leper, he touches a leper. And, and what's so incredible about that, and, and, and I, I do want, for those of you who maybe haven't heard me talk about this before, especially for those of you who, I mean, I know restrictions are starting to lift. You can go to restaurants again. You can finally go back on planes. But for many people who have felt like social outcasts over the last two years, this is incredible. Jesus was willing to touch those with contagious, communicable diseases. He didn't lepers that were left outside the city, that were left outside of the community, that were not given the social perks of being part of the citizenship. Jesus not only sought them out to heal them, but in healing them, he touched them. And that's a massive, massive deal. We'll get to that a little bit more as we work our way through. I don't want to focus on that quite as much. What I do want to focus on is, is Mark's sort of li literary device here. You have to understand that lepers, like I said, were social outcasts. They had their own little um, sort of like shanty towns outside of the town, right? So they weren't allowed to come in. They weren't allowed to use social services. They weren't allowed in the, in the temple. They weren't allowed in the synagogues. They weren't allowed to exchange money in the, uh, with the system. They weren't allowed to be a part of the social system. And so you have these lepers who often lived in, in little kind of shanty towns outside of a town, or quite frankly, there were colonies of them out in the wilderness because they weren't allowed anywhere else. And so if you're unclean, might as well be unclean together. And so they made their own little communities outside of the, ma the, the main community. And so in understanding that, I want you to see what Mark did here. I think it's really, really interesting. Lepers were isolated. They were alone. They were unable to live in the city. And notice what happens after Jesus touches this leper, after he heals this leper. He says, don't tell anybody about it. What happens? Verse 45 but he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news, listen to this, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. Lepers could not openly enter towns. But he was out in desolate places, like a leper. I think what, what Mark is employing here is he's using this language very intentionally about what lepers weren't allowed to do and where lepers ended up living to show that in healing this leper, in putting his sort of reputation on the line, in touching this leper, Jesus is actually taking the place of that leper. He tells him to go, go and talk to the, uh, the priests, and that would be how a leper would show themselves to be clean. So he would go, undergo uh, uh, some tests, a few days would go by, and then he was actually allowed to rejoin the community. Once it was determined that he was clean, he could go back into the towns. He could go back into the community. But Jesus, as a result of healing this leper, was no longer allowed to go into towns. Not because he was unclean, but because of his popularity did not allow him to actually do the ministry he wanted to. But the way Mark uh, describes this, I think, is foreshadowing for us the Savior who takes the place of sinners. He cleanses the leper, and then he takes the leper's place out in desolate places, the social outcast who's not a part of society. So symbolizing his taking on the shame and the punishment for those that he touches and stands in his place. And that kind of moves us towards the big idea. The big idea today is this. The lion displays his power by his willingness to be the substitutional and sacrificial lamb. The lion displays his power by his willingness to be the substitutional and sacrificial lamb. 
this is that contrast that I'm going to keep bringing you back to in this series. Jesus is the lion and he's the lamb. I've said this many times before, but meekness, when Jesus is described as meek, you have to understand that meekness is not weakness. Oftentimes when we hear the word meek, we think of somebody who is timid, right? Somebody who is maybe a little bit weak, somebody who's non-confrontational, but that's not what meekness means. Meekness is simply power that has been tamed or restrained. The word itself actually comes from the the bit that's put in a wild stallion's uh, mouth in order to tame it. So the the word actually comes from the ability to tame a wild stallion. A, A wild stallion that's been broken is now just as powerful as it once was. It's not like its power gets taken away, but it's that its power comes under the control of the rider. So meekness is actually power that's been restrained. Some of you are going to roll your eyes because you've heard this analogy before, but that's Clark Kent, right? Clark Kent is the meek and mild-mannered reporter, right? He's Superman in all of his power. Even though he's dressed like a bumbling buffoon who works for the Daily Planet, He's still got all of the power and all of the poise of Superman, but he clothes himself in the disguise of Clark Kent because the meek, mild-mannered Clark Kent is the restrained power of Superman. And so Jesus is meek, but meekness is merely power that's been restrained, um, uh, power that's been tamed. The most powerful person in the room is usually the one who's least on edge, least threatened, least intimidated, right? Usually the one who's puffing out their chest, jostling to be noticed, or jostling for position is the one who's the least secure. The least powerful is always the most preoccupied with looking powerful, But the one who's truly powerful isn't concerned with how he looks because he knows he's powerful. Just notice Sensei Neil in the door. You know what makes Sensei Neil so scary? Because he'll laugh and he'll smile at you right up until the point where it's time to ninja kick some bad guys. (laughs) Because he knows that he has power that's restrained. And that's what we see in Christ. That's what we see in Jesus. Jesus' power is not only displayed through his meekness and his humility, it's actually made more beautiful by it. I I, I want you to get this, because one of my goals in this series is to help you fall more in love with Jesus. That's one of the goals of this series. That's why we're going through a gospel account. Fall more in love with Jesus. And one of the ways that that happens is by us seeing his glory his beauty, his majesty in the pages of Mark's gospel. And I think this is really beautiful. The only truly clean person who never violated ceremonial law touched lepers to make them clean. That's power, right? It's not just amazing that God is, or that Jesus is powerful. It's that he's powerful, and yet he restrains his power, and he uses his power to help the weak. That's what makes his power all the more beautiful. And so listen to some of these things. The famous one who is pursued by the crowds to meet their needs lived like a nomad wandering in the wilderness in Galilee so that lepers could have community. The most intelligent man who ever lived could have achieved high academics, debated all the big brains of his day, went on tour, but instead he called simple fishermen to come with him to start fishing for men. The most valuable being in the universe took the punishment that invaluable sinners like you and I deserved. That's incredible. Doesn't that just add to the value of Jesus? Doesn't that add to the beauty that you see in him? That not only is he powerful, not only is he wonderful, not only is he glorious, but he gives all of that up for people like us. The most powerful being in the universe allowed himself to be beaten, mocked, and killed so that you can go free. The most righteous being in the universe took on your sin and endured the wrath of God against it so that you could experience peace with God. See, what helps us fall in love with Jesus is not all of his, just, just all of his attributes. It's what all of his attributes are and the fact that he humbled himself to serve and to save us. We never think of those who are in power stooping 
those who are popular stooping to come to our level. But that's what makes Jesus and all of his power all the more precious. If you struggle with feelings of inadequacy, focus on the reality that Jesus, the Prince of Heaven, the Lamb of God, loved you enough to die for you. If you struggle with crippling insecurity, know today that the Lion of Judah rose again to give you eternal life and gifts that equip you for service in his kingdom. You might notice that on your outline there, I have no direct application for you except this. If you truly believe that the Lion of Heaven became a sacrificial lamb in order to make you his, then that knowledge equips you to be lion and lamb-like in your own life. Courageous in your pursuit of truth, bold in your fight against darkness, uh, bold in your fight against darkness, lies, and tyranny, and yet sacrificial in your serving of others. Gentle when falsely accused, humble as you interact with the proud world, and with meekness using the strength that God gives you to bring about the flourishing of others. In, in a sense, there's going to be several times throughout this series where the application is simply, go and be like Jesus. That sounds, obviously, like a tall order, but here's the point. The point is, is that God has blessed you and equipped you in remarkable ways. If you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, which every single person who has been saved by the, um, from the wrath of God through faith in Jesus Christ has, then you have been equipped for service in his kingdom. You have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And like Jesus, who had all of the power of God at his disposal, but used his power to help the lowly, to help the destitute, to help the outcast, to help the sinner like you and me. We ought to use all of our privilege, all of our power, all of our strength, and all that God has given to us to meet the needs of those who are less. And there are all kinds of people in your life who might not seem, might not seem like they are weaker, might not seem like they are lowly, But every single person who stands out in the darkness is going to one day be looking in. Every single person who is outside of God's grace is somebody that you need to use your power, your strength, your knowledge, your privilege in order to go and bring them into the family of God. And that happens by loving them, by allowing your life to be interruptible, by not getting so fixated and focused on your own plans that you're unwilling to help those that God is thrusting in your path, what it looks like for the kingdom of God to expand now that the lion is sitting at the right hand of God is for all of us to be lion-like and lamb-like in every sphere that God's placed us. And the more, we, the more clearly we see Jesus and the more we love him for who he is, the more we desire to be like him and the more the spirit begins to transform us into his likeness so that we can be on on a lookout for all of those who god has placed in our sphere that we need to use our power in order to serve let's pray heavenly father we thank you for your word we thank you lord that it teaches us and it trains us in righteousness we thank you lord for the clear way in which we see jesus depicted in these gospels i pray lord that even over the next several weeks as we continue to study as we continue to learn i pray that we would see jesus more and more clearly and as we do lord that our love and our affection for him would grow and lord as we see him and as we desire to be like him i pray lord that you would help us to be able to imitate both his lamb-like qualities and his lion-like qualities Help us to, like our King, be willing to serve those that we feel are beneath our time, our effort, or our opportunities. Change our hearts that we would have compassion on those like Jesus does. And Lord, may our lives be always interruptible when it comes to your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.